we decided to go for a very uh, unique look that encloses, uh, partially encloses the front suspension. You can still see it a lot because we want people to see and understand that, hey, look, you know, this thing works differently from other bikes. At the same time, we wanted it to have uh, low front end lift. And that's why you get that shape. You know, I got one here. <laughs> but you can see it come over the front. Uh, the other thing that we did a lot of studies on how to best package the absolute maximum battery capacity in the bike. So we wanted to have the absolute highest volume fraction of the bike that was cells. So as many cells as you could pack into the smallest possible weight and space. And we realized that after a lot of analysis that a lot of riders use motorcycle tank bags. You know, you're riding along, you've got it here in front of you. And uh, no one has an issue with those. A lot of people do very long distances. Couriers use them all the time. Economically, they work really well. They don't get in the way. So we saw that as wasted space when bikes don't use it. Uh -huh. And we, we made use of that, which is hence, hence the shape of our bike. And the flexibility of having, uh, you know, an all-electric um, urban sports bike, we can put it. We 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 can manage where we put that mass much more flexibly. You know, if you have a four-cylinder engine and a gearbox, there's only certain places you can put that. You know, That's it's right. going to have exhaust coming out of it. You you can't have them coming out of the tank, and you can't have mm. the inlet trumpet sort of behind your backside. It, it's got to be uh, a certain layout. Whereas with uh, with our cell system, which is also our structure, we don't have a separate structure. Our battery pack is our structure. Mm. Uh, we are able to put the mass exactly where we want it and manage the mass and the, the polar moment of inertia of the whole bike as effectively as possible. Uh, we match the center of gravity position of uh, a couple of, I'm, I'm not going to name them, but a couple of real benchmark leading uh, handling motorcycles from uh, one a Japanese company and one an Italian company. Uh -huh. We matched their CFG, we put it in you know, a very, very similar position and then we worked hard to concentrate the masses much to a much greater extent than either of those two motorcycles do. It's, it's actually uh, a, a sort of, it was inspired and in, in is a uh, similar system to the Hossack system of front suspension, which is actually a double wishbone front suspension system, much like your F1 cars have. Uh, we use two wishbones. It lets us set up any characteristic we want. It can feel like a normal bike. It can feel very different from a normal bike. We set it up so it feels like a normal bike, but it does certain things very differently from a normal bike. We get the stability at the same time as we get that amazing ability to change direction quickly, and that's really what we were after. I have a friend who, uh, he described switching layout from conventional bike to our, uh, our type of front end bike, that when he went back to the conventional bike, he was sure that the steering head bearings had a problem. He right. was sure, he got back on it, it was like, damn, I've got to strip that because there's something wrong with it. Uh, and, and it was, for him, it was just the level of accuracy and control, and the, the, like the feel of it, how much you actually could feel. And we worked a lot with the damper companies to get it just right. You know, it's like, well, if you had your dream suspension setup, guys, what would it be? You know, where do you want it? How much travel do you want? And where do you want it to sit? Not, here's the styling, make it work. You know, I've worked for other companies. We've done design work where we've been told, hey, look, there's the swing arm. And yeah, here's where the damper should go. But we want you to hide it here and, and try and figure out some complex linkage to still make it work. And I always watch the damper guys in those meetings with that kind of expression like, one day, one day <laughs> will win. Yeah. And we thought, no, we'll stuff that. We want this thing to handle, right? And who knows best about damping? Well, the damper guys. So we really sat down with them right from the beginning and went, okay, well, how do you want it? You know? And we talked to quite a few different companies. Um, and there's three, or three slash four, really, a fourth one got involved a lot more towards the end as well, that have been fantastic and have really uh, helped develop and say, yep, this is the dream damper setup. This is the motion ratio we want. Can you give us this and we'll look after the contact patch for you? And it was like, yeah, guys, go for it. You know? Well, I'd say two things really stood out most. My friend, who's uh, a currently serving Royal Marine, flipping himself on the bike, uh, because I told him that the throttle response, this is before we put in uh, automatic wheelie control. Right. I told him that the throttle response on an electric, you know, powerful electric bike like this is instantaneous. There is no power curve. You, you just, 
you do that and it's all there. Mm. So if you're not ready for that, you will flip at the traffic lights. Uh, radio layout electric motor. It's a, it's it's a it's a beast. And the way it cools itself is it breathes in through the core. It acts like a giant turbine and breathes out through the 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 ring, uh, the outer ring of it. So it's it's working like a giant turbine. And if you think of kind of jet engines of the 50s and 60s, they didn't kind of whistle; they roared because you know because the way the flow has to rip its way through there. Hmm. So like. I think it has a great sound naturally, um, but we've already had, you know, obviously we're going to offer it. A lot of people want to customize their sounds and want their bikes to sound like, I don't know, Hem Hemi V8 from the 1970s. <laughs> well, they can make it sound like that if they want to. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we want to really interact a heck of a lot with the community, the fleet of people, the community of people who are going to be riding our bikes. And we want to be able to give them a much more interactive experience, you know, get online, download a different sound, download a different uh, acceleration characteristic, download a different feel for the bike. You know, the, the, the R&D department of somebody like, I'm going to pick a good one, somebody like Ducati, they've got a good R&D department for a bike company, right? They, they don't have the biggest budget in the world, they're a tight small team, but they work damn hard and they're good. Now, if you compare that R&D budget and department, and you say, well, that's, you know, that's a pretty damn good R&D budget and department, and you compare it to the combination of Hitachi, Panasonic, Sony, Google, Apple, uh, you, any consumer electronics giant on the planet that has anything to do with mobile technology is pushing electric technology and electric uh, power storage. Yeah, I mean, if you're sitting looking at a laptop, the technology in that machine is helping push the technology in our bike. So we don't have just you know one bike company's R and D department improving, say a couple of valves in a four valve cylinder head. We we've got Panasonic pushing and we've got NASA pushing and you know the cross section of people pushing this technology is huge. And anyone who doesn't realize that in the next three to five years we're going to see a shift is is sort of a bit in cloud cuckoo land. 